Chopasa Mufasa. What's up, everybody? Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. I myself do not have a PhD, so it's quite interesting to share this stage, you know, and follow so many illustrious academics. Although I did provide mushrooms to a number of uh, people and route to their PhDs. So I feel like I earned two of those three letters, PD, psilocybin dealer. But alas, it's satire. Okay, it's satire partially. What is satire? It's an intentional exaggeration of the truth. Okay, it's artful deception and misinformation. And I'm going to make the case today that I actually think it's a great lens for unpacking our current world and the current information ecosystem we live in and psychedelics as well. And so I'll talk a little bit about the trickster archetype, right? This archetype of uh, an entity that lives outside of the cultural norm and that, you know, teaches lessons to people. And it's omnipresent across history, be it the jester and the, the Renaissance, right? The actual Renaissance, not the psychedelic Renaissance is a little hubristic to me. I feel like we should be like drinking grog and jousting, trying to out patent each other. But anyways, so I run a podcast called Mycopreneur Podcast. And quite literally, it started out interviewing mushroom entrepreneurs. And that was my idea and has been for a long time that fungi and mushrooms are an advanced technology, not just on the psychedelic angle, but like you look at what people are doing, creating sustainable and innovative materials and packaging solutions, mycotexture, microremediation, et cetera, et cetera. So I started hearing stories from all over the place and I started seeing major brands and departments like the Department of Defense and NASA, et cetera, brands like Ikea, Adidas, investing in fungi technology. And I thought, wow, there's so many people I know who are doing this, even in places like Uganda, like sub-Saharan Africa or India and Bangalore, and they're doing incredible work. Well, then the psychedelic renaissance came along and everybody wanted to talk about psilocybin mushrooms. I said, great, I want to talk about those too. Big fan. So uh, actually, there was an entire other column here of golden teachers, but I swooped in under cover of darkness and absconded with them. So I'm sure you understand. All right, uh, I got a clicker here. So let's do it. I got more stand-up material I'm going to intersperse. So you'll have to guess what's bullshit and what's not. So this is one of the four social media spiritual authority, psychedelic authority archetypes that I've identified. And it's the 22-year-old TikTok shaman. I'm sure some of you are familiar with some of these, some of these characters. And the idea, something I've noticed, having an academic and professional background in media studies and media production and being on the first wave of social media and having my practice and my business highly informed by my psychedelic experiences, was that there's, there's like no barrier to entry for being like a you know, psychedelic authority on social media. And I started seeing this a lot with platforms and with brands and with people that would reach out to me to come on Mycopreneur podcast and I kind of do some due diligence or meet him, meet him at a conference. And you realize, you know, this person just had their first psychedelic experience, maybe in like 2021. And now all of a sudden they've got like a influencer channel and they've got a hundred thousand followers on TikTok. And, you know, having spent a lot of time in Mexico, I've seen this a lot too. It's like people going to Tulum and leading these ceremonies and building out their TikTok presence or Instagram presence. And I just think it's wonderful for satirical material. Probably a bad idea to, you know, entrust yourselves to their, their service and care. But for satire, it's a fucking goldmine. So it's what I'm primarily concerned with. And then also, I just want to note that satire, I feel, is so important for today's world because we truly live in many ways in like a post-truth reality where facts seem to be up for debate, right? And like, it's like that parable of the blind people touching the elephant where like one person's got the trunk, one person's got the other side. Everyone thinks they're correct. And that's like a fundamental flaw, I think, in a lot of how people approach this like psychedelic renaissance is people assuming that because they have a particular lens of experience that's very personally relevant to them, that's its objective reality. Reality. So again, great for satire, kind of difficult for, you know, advancing the actual movement. So yeah, here's a few of the things. And these are all like based, it's sort of an amalgamation, right? They're like based on real people I've met or seen. Uh, but I, you know, dramatize it a little bit, take creative liberties, if you will. So uh, 100,000 followers on TikTok, you know, that seems to be the primary 
skill set for a lot of people running uh, some of these some of these businesses is that they're good at manipulating the algorithm. And I'm going to get to that shortly, where I'll show you like an actual screenshot that I decontextualized. I pulled the information and put it on a different image because I'm not really into like pointing fingers at people. It's just more like, hey, this is kind of ridiculous. We should talk about this. So this is a, another thing you see a lot in these like little bubbles, right? Like if you've seen these influencers in Bali, you know, these like white people who go out to Bali and they try to sell these TikTok courses. And I just think uh, there, there's probably a lot more that we should be talking about, uh, especially if you're at home, you're in the States or whatever, where I'm from, and you see these people living this incredible life and being so free and all this, like, yeah, you're going to want to go sign up for their program. And, you know, so I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but I'm going to get more to it. So that's the first archetype is the 22 year old TikTok shaman. I can click to the next one. Great. Oh, yeah. The microdosing coach. Number two, this is one of my favorite ones, you know, and I have a lot of friends who are microdosing coaches or have businesses. And again, like, it's not my role, I think, to tell them if they're right or wrong. It's my role to roast them, you know, to satirize them. And people have this like misconception about me that I have like an agenda that I'm trying to drive. It's like my primary agenda is I want to be fucking hilarious, right? And like, I love bringing laughter to people. And I feel like that's a very valid form of psychedelic therapy right there. Just like the fact that, you know what I'm saying? It is medicine. Like it's not hype. If people laugh, I have so many people who tell me like the only reason I'm on Instagram is because you post a reel every day and you're doing it. And I just like love to share this. I never thought that this was going to be the route I took. You know, I was, on my podcast, I've had at least 12 CEOs or founders of publicly traded companies. And I've you know done uh, podcasts, et cetera, with like many very well-known figures in the space. And it was only after I started doing the satire that the broader international community started paying attention. And like to encapsulate it nicely, I was at South by Southwest. I got a press pass there and I was at one of the after parties and this young woman of Pakistani descent came up to me and she's like, it's you. And she started crying like in front of me. And she's like, you made this video called the woke capitalist spiritual retreat center about like these white people, you know, acting like faux shaman. And she's like, I had just come from Guatemala from an experience that was very difficult for me. That was like that, where I felt a sense of exclusion. And like, you know, I, I didn't feel like I belonged there. And it was just this kind of like elitist capitalist, you know, white people wearing linen parading around. She's like, and that video, that satire was such a cathartic release. And like, was so like, I've got that response from a lot of people. And I thought, oh, this is bad news for the multinationals, because now I'm just going to go after all of them, and just, you know, roast them. So here's the next one, the microdosing coach. Uh, I love it when they charge sacred numbers. You know, I just think it's great. Like it's three, 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 you know? Okay. How'd you land on that number? I saw it. I downloaded it. Right. Uh, also chat GPT. I just think it's great. You know, so many people running all this. Uh, there's, there's a lot of serious stuff we could talk about, but I just think it's hilarious that this is how, you know, the direction it's going. Live streams or cold plunges. You've probably seen that. And a strong background in sales seems to be a prerequisite for being a psychedelic influencer. All right. That's Kenny Powers, by the way, if anyone's unfamiliar. Great show. Okay. Corporate carnival barker. Uh, maybe some of y'all know these folks, right? Is uh, this idea that I've seen of people pivoting into the psychedelic space from another space, you know? And I think there's plenty of coverage or there should be more, I guess, of some of these, these unscrupulous practices. But like the funny thing is, like I started the podcast and primarily was interviewing people I know personally. Like, you know, I went to school in San Francisco and before that as a high school in San Diego, I was very interested in entheogens and psychedelic experiences. And so I developed kind of a network, but I always had to be underground with it as many people did. You know, I come from a quite conservative background. I've taught multimedia in public high schools. I worked at a church for a while. So like this idea of sharing psychedelic experiences was not really in the cards for me. So finally, when people started talking about it, I was like, fuck yeah, I can finally share all my stories. So. Anyways, uh, I was serving that demographic, like kind of the weirdo, oddball people that I know and recording with them. And then when the podcast started to get traction, all of these like executives come out of the woodwork and all want to like you need to do free promo for their, you know, multi-million dollar brands, which I figured out a way for them to pay me to make them look bad. It's kind of nice, like roast them, satirize them. And anyways, that's another story. So this is a one I just like building skits around like one key phrase that just makes me laugh. And, you know, a lot of these characters are 
uh, designed off of real people. But this idea of like someone who's a psychedelic CEO or a psychedelic executive, and they've microdosed once and they saw faces in the guacamole at the Super Bowl after party. I can just like picture that's the type of energy some of these people bring, you know, and I think it's great. And uh, the great part is I get to have conversations with them too. And that's how I figured out that satire works is a lot of people would be like, hey, man, I think I'm your target. So your target for your satire. And I think it's hilarious. I'm like, oh, this is good. This is really good. Okay. So, and then another one, which actually uh, there's a lot of overlap with what some of the people up here before me were talking about, where people drawing wild conclusions off of limited data sets. And, you know, there's, without naming names, like I've heard enough people talk about psychedelics is going to be a trillion dollar industry. And they just go around beating the drum talking about a trillion dollar industry. And I just think like, Says who? Like every company I've seen is losing a fuck ton of money right now. Like, I don't know, maybe. All right. So next one. Yeah. The conspirituality cult leader is a good one too. We all know people like this. Yeah. So I've had a very colorful, interesting life. And, you know, this particular character, I feel like I spent some time in Malibu cat sitting. It was lovely. It was like people in Malibu have so much money that they just pay you to stay at their nice house and watch their cat. I'm like, this is a good gig. Good. Okay. But anyways, I met some of these characters, you know, who like you start talking to them and then that, that conspirituality archetype, which I think, you know, has been discussed, probably could be discussed more, but about, uh, you know, the possibility of people forming cults or being attracted to that and exploiting vul vulnerabilities in people, right? It's like, it's, and I, I've seen this too, like with the ayahuasca tourism industry, right? It's like, there's been a fair amount of abuses that have occurred because there's not really a regulating body or anything. And that's, an, again, another conversation, but you find these people who have very charismatic, strong personalities and like, who's kind of checking on them, you know? So that's a, another fun. Oh, I love it how like everybody wants crypto, the bubble burst, they all pivoted into psychedelics. I don't know if you've seen this, but like uh, plenty of these people, I go out to Miami, I've been out there a few times and like everybody's a psychedelic entrepreneur. And I was like, six months ago, you were touting Bitcoin and then you lost your life savings on a pyramid scheme. And now you're all of a sudden, you're like the psychedelic savior, like amazing. And it's amazing how that works. One other thing about satire, I think, you know, the, in particular, social media, I, you know, I was on the first wave of it and I studied it at school and we were like making YouTube videos in 2007 and we were, you know, smoking DMT and all that. It was like widely available in San Francisco. I went to USF right on the hate. So like I had a very interesting sort of formative entree into the world of psychedelics and there wasn't like a lot of people outside of our bubbles talking about it. So I had to kind of draw my own conclusions about a lot of things and study the available literature, you know, reading things that Jonathan Ott had published and, you know, browsing through Arrowhead and connecting with the legacy communities in the Bay area and beyond. So I just think uh, this is another really interesting character there. And another cool thing, just an aside, uh, Pablo Amaringo's art, you're probably familiar. I got an email from him one time and I hold on to that. It was like really cool. It was like years ago. So next one. Oh, yeah, has a Joe Rogan amulet, you know? I like Joe, but, like, some people worship that dude, you know? Okay, this is me in 2010 on Hippie Hill on 420, and I just wanted to stick that in there as a little context for, like, the path I've been on studying media. That's a 16-millimeter Bolex camera, and as part of a class project, I went to Hippie Hill on 420, as I always did in Golden Gate Park, and shot a bunch of our classmates with 16-millimeter film smoking weed and then screened it for all of our families and for a uh, final class project. But it was such a culture, and, you know, I was in the independent cinema sort of branch of things where that was totally acceptable and people were super into it. And then also just uh, that photo means a lot to me. That's one of my very good friends, Kareem Ilya. And it shows that like when I was having my psychedelic experiences and, you know, I had quite a few back then and it drew me, those experiences drew me towards the oddballs and like the disruptors and the interesting people. Right. And Kareem was one such person and continues to be. And I'm very proud to share that this year, he's actually going to be orbiting the moon. He's been selected to go with a group of 12 artists to orbit the moon in a project called Dear Moon. And that same story kind of plays out about, about with many of the classmates I spent time with. So I feel like there's a sense of like, you have to choose who you're with very wisely, right? And like, you want to be with creative, interesting people. And I feel like social media, oftentimes, uh, it, some people don't have those communities, don't have access to that. So they look to, you know, these really ebullient, charismatic figures, and you get inducted into their orbit. So, and speaking of orbit, that's pretty fucking badass. Dude's going to the moon. Cool. All right. So this is a subject I've written about for Lucid News as well, about this phenomenon of 
of drug content and social media. And I borrowed some research from my friend Rana Hashimi, if anyone's familiar with her. She runs an organization called No Drugs, and we're both very passionate about changing the paradigm around drug education for youth and for high schoolers. I myself, as a high schooler, had almost nowhere to turn except for the internet when I started getting interested in drugs. And I didn't really have a safe container, as many people don't, to speak about my drug experiences at a you know very seminal age. And then a decade later, when I was teaching high school, it was the same thing. You know, D.A.R.E. is still active in 75% of U.S. public schools, which is ridiculous. Like, you can't preach abstinence. It doesn't work, okay? So, yeah, I think that's something we need to talk about. So, anyways, uh, with social media, the nature of social media is performative. It's like mirror neurons, monkey see, monkey do, right? So, people kind of see something happening, and then they think it's maybe good. And in Rana's research she's done through, she's getting her PhD at Stanford right now, 27 of the 30 students interviewed in their study had been exposed to peer-generated instances of substance use, and they're positive. So it's just like people unilaterally, you know, posting videos of them vaping or talking about this and that. But then that's countered with a very polarizing messaging from authority, which is saying, oh, don't do this. This is dangerous. So it's like, where's, you know, where's the harm reduction lens in the middle? How can you actually have a sensible conversation about psychedelics or drug use? And I argue that the media in many ways does the same thing. Like there's, and I'm going to get into this shortly, but like there are ketamine companies that target 18 year olds or 19 year olds with, with ads on social media. And, you know, there are people even on LinkedIn, some of these corporate carnival barkers talking about just like these unabashed incredible, you know, it's going to solve all your problems. Mushrooms solve PTSD and depression. Okay. Well, I think it can be very valuable. I think that that narrative has to be tempered with the realities, right? Of a more inclusive framework of approaching things. So I think a lot of people here I've, I've heard agree. And by the way, I'm like an inveterate stoner and a, you know, huge mushroom evangelist too. So absolutely love the stuff. So let's uh, move to the next. There it is. Boom. So I did a little research and I just saw that this has actually been written about recently. I believe this was uh, this month. Yeah, April 2023. And this journal, and again, I don't have a PhD, but I do occasionally read academic literature, right? And uh, But that th this is happening, that you have social media where everyone is an authority. And for me, it's almost like that confirmation bias where I'm like, I've been following this thread for a while and it's nice to see people picking up on it. You know, it's like, how do you vet? How do you distinguish? And while I think social media is also a great tool in a lot of ways, it has created a bottleneck of information for a lot of people where you, it's really hard to evaluate what's true, right? And like, and we also conflate metrics with authority. So like, if you have, like I have, I want influencer of the year, bro. I, I did at this uh, psychedelic convention. And the idea is like, if you have a bunch of followers, people automatically think that like you're, you're an authority or factual. And I think that that's really dangerous because that motivates a lot of people to build those platforms. And I've, I've worked for some of these organizations too, where they've employed me on a contractual basis where their primary objective is page clicks or views. And maybe some of them are in the psychedelic space. So it's not, you know, necessarily about, uh, like, fair and rigorous reporting of what's happening. It's how many views can we get on our webpage? How many likes can I get on my photo? So I just think that's like a phenomenon right now where people conflate authority with like your public profile, right? Public figures. They must have done something to get to that position. So it's kind of nice to see the, the academics taking this on. All right. This is a one of the... So I make like short satire videos, among other things. And this, I actually like pulled these little clips from a real TikTok profile. It's probably too small to read, but I'll read you a, a few of them. But like, I just noticed a few people who were doing this, like maybe a half dozen. And so they say mushroom coaching certifications are now open for people looking to either become a coach or expand their coaching. And it includes very conveniently how to authentically create and sell a program generating five to 20K per month. Okay, would it shock you if I told you that the person posting this is in their early 20s? You know, and they also have, and there's, there's another one. I, I'm going to try to be ambiguous in general here because it's not my goal to like publicly shame or humiliate. Well, it is to humiliate people, but I don't want to like name them, you know, but like people who choose the name like psychedelic therapy expert or psychedelic therapy collective and who's running the account. It's like a 25 year old, you know, 25 year old who's had a few mushroom experiences 
And that's their, and I just think that this is very problematic because especially for young people, knowing how young people having a frame of reference for how they evaluate things and, you know, try, it's very difficult to be discerning and nuanced. Like you hear all this hype about how good psychedelics are for you, you know, how good this is. And of course, you know, a lot of young people struggle with things like depression and anxiety. So like you start seeing all these headlines promoted and then you start seeing the psychedelic therapy collective, you know, with a hundred thousand followers, it's like, you might want to check out what they're saying. And I think that it's worthwhile to at least, well, first satirize them and just make fun of them. And second, have a serious, sober conversation about where we're headed with all this. Oh, I like that last one. Create unstoppable confidence. That's good. I'm unstoppable. All right. Yes. And then you get to psychedelic water. Uh, I don't know. I've never said this out loud. Kaikion, Kaikion, something like that. You know what I'm talking about. But uh, so this is uh, another viral sensation from TikTok. And they've raised millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, it has no psychedelic substances in it. It's quite frankly absurd and like really low hanging fruit for comedy and satire. But like the fact that psychedelic water exists right now, it's like, can't we just have regular clean water? Like we have enough of an issue with that, I think. Maybe we address the regular clean water first before we get to the psychedelic water. Just me. But I, I did have a thought of like, sometimes I'm really tempted to launch like meme brands because they're very, everything I've done with memes has become like successful. So I'm like, should I just like create microdose water and start selling it and then funnel the proceeds into, you know, nonprofits? The thought is there. All right. So I just want to point out too, like some of my formative years and psychedelic experiences in 2010, I went down to Oaxaca and with a group of friends did a road trip from Oaxaca to Costa Rica during the summer after my junior year. And we were very interested in mushrooms. Very, I had been for a number of years at that point and pretty, you know, regularly experiencing them. And I kind of on a whim, we're like, hey, there's this town, Huatla de Jimenez, Maria Sabina. It's not that far from our, our route we're on. So we drove up there. And this was kind of during that quiet period. This was like 2010. And there was no one, like no foreigners in the town. And, you know, I speak Spanish. My friends were native Spanish speakers. So we just asked a kid. We're like, hey, can you take us to Maria Sabina's house? He's like, give me five bucks. He's like, give me a hundred pick. Okay. And he drove us up there. And we quite literally just like went up and just like, hey, how's everyone doing? And they kind of looked at us like, well, we're good. We're good. And then we're like, we would just love to see like if Maria Sabina. We had also heard that like they do have a little museum there or a shrine. And we're like, we'd love to see it. And they're, they're like, hey, do you want to stay the night? Do you want to hang out for a few days? I'm like, absolutely. You know, no question. So we spent two nights there with uh, the direct descent, descendants of the Sabina family, which actually I believe their last name is uh, Guzman. I might have that wrong, but it's not Sabina. Sabina was an honorary title conferred upon her. So like a lot of the people in the family, you know, people erroneously assume that's their last name, but it's, uh, I believe it's Guzman. So we spent two nights there. And as far as like the reverence for, for mushrooms, that first night, I, without even consuming mushrooms, I had a, a really intense experience where my eyes, one of them was paralyzed open. I woke up in the middle of the night and I couldn't close my eye. It was just like completely open like this. And I had a very distinct sense that I was in the throes of a very powerful force and something that went way beyond my ability to rationalize it or understand it. I've never had an experience before or after something like that. So we stayed the next night, you know, I was undeterred. I felt very confident, like I had just been given like a little, hey, you're welcome here, but you got to watch out. And uh, so we had a mushroom ceremony with her great nephew, I believe. And again, it's like almost impossible to rationalize this kind of thing. So I, I still have a great sense. I've always had a great sense of reverence and respect for this sort of mystery element that we don't understand that a lot of people attempt to reduce or rationalize and whatnot. And I guess why I bring that up is because through talking to them, and I've been back since then, I've been uh, two years ago, I stayed with them again, and I'm learning from people in the town and talking to my friend Inti, if anybody knows Inti Garcia Flores, who's the custodian of the Mazatec archives, incredible work he's doing, I encourage you to, uh, you can talk to me later if you want to find out more about that, he's a custodian of archives of like uh, 16 millimeter film going back to the thirties. And like, here's Maria Sabina's wedding video VHS from her second wedding. And just like all kinds of incredible artifacts and letters to the King of Spain from 500 years ago. So anyways, I, I learned and asked them a lot of questions, filmed some interviews. You know, they invited me to stay for like five days. And one of the things I learned is like, not everybody in that culture eats mushrooms or takes mushrooms. I think there's a misconception that like the indigenous people, right? They like, everybody eats mushrooms. It's like, 
I heard that from them directly, maybe 20% or 30% of the people in the community actually eat the mushrooms. And this is according to them from on the ground sources. So I think that there's also a narrative we have to be careful about of like reducing it and fetishizing it about like everybody should take psychedelics. It's like, I don't think even in a lot of indigenous cultures, that was the truth. And I, we can hear more from the experts on that. So I'll leave it at that. But that's my perception and from what I've directly learned from people working very closely with the medicine. Okay, boom. Satire as resistance. This is kind of what I've landed on right now, where there's the archetypes of you've got the fox who shows up in a lot of different Native American myths and across cultures as being this sort of trickster element, this trickster character who lives outside of the cultural norm and who teaches lessons to people about morality, right? And I think that's the key differentiation between satire and comedy is that with satire, there's a moral component. There's this idea of like, how do we guide people? How do we provide a frame of reference to people to navigate the world? And I think with comedy, like you can just tell fart jokes, which are awesome too, you know, but satire has kind of a moral component. So there, there, that's the role, I think, in these different folk tales and whatnot. You've got the jester and the, the real renaissance, right, is the court jester. And as people are probably familiar, the court jester is the only one who could tell the king to go fuck himself. So it's kind of the position I feel like I've landed in right here. It's really nice to be a jester in the psychedelic renaissance. You know, you can make fun of, you know, point things out, but uh, it's more of like a loving way of pointing things out. It's not so stern, you know. So the court jester and then Rafiki, like he's one of my guiding lights in this world, just like seems crazy, but he actually is just so joyful, right? Like just so infectiously joyful and uh, also uh, has a lot of sort of prophetic insights into things. And so I just wanted to include that slide to talk about like satire as being kind of a, a very underserved a niche, a niche, if you will, that I think we need more people uh, uh, looking into this. And along those lines, we live in such an era of polarity right now, right? The political discourse is in the gutter. You have just like so it's a communications breakdown. And I think that social media exacerbates that, right? Not being able to like openly one-on-one -on -one debate people, you know, it's kind of a lost art, I think. And I, I find that satire is a great vehicle for approaching more challenging subjects and for, you know, learning how to examine something and be general with it. Uh, and maybe the other party will listen. And that's something I've seen a lot is people saying like, oh, shit, I saw myself in that satirical video you posted, right? It's like, you're not overtly telling someone uh, what they should do. You're just making like kind of a general social commentary and observation. I've also had to do quite a bit of research on protected speech and satire, because uh, the more you start, you know, gaining a platform and profile, you start satirizing certain individuals or companies, you start seeing why Sasha Baron Cohen has a really robust legal team, you know? <laughs> so, so if anyone here is legal counsel, we might have a future together. All right. Yeah, so this is the very definition of satire, is that it's the use of humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices, right? And uh, by the way, I, I chose all like affluent white straight men for those slides because they're the easiest to criticize, I think. You know, and I feel like I like punching up. I don't ever want to punch down. Punching up, great. Okay, so... That's just like the general broad definition, I think, of satire. And, you know, again, as mentioned, we live in what's arguably sort of a post-truth world where people, even if you have a fact, it's still somehow debatable, you know, and people say, oh, that's not, that's an alternative fact, if you will, or whatnot. What? Okay. So uh, being able to develop a sense of humor is, is such a powerful act of resistance. And it's something I've learned a lot about. It's like, when I see something that triggers me, I'll be like, why is that triggering me? And can I make fun of it? Or can I, you know, can I, so like, let's say you're in a DMT experience and you come across a really, you know, dark entity, just picture that entity naked works every time. Right. <laughs> so booyah. Okay. This is like some more examples of satire headlines I've made. And like at a certain point, my goal has become to become the onion of the psychedelic space, which I think we sorely need. And so the, the great part is that like, Quite serious people have been like really upset when they see stuff like this. And they're like, oh, they, well, upset in the sense that they didn't get it with satire. Like I have to label it, you know, and they'd be like, where's your sources for this? I'm like, if you think I have to put a source on this, we have bigger problems. Okay. Like it's quite, the whole point of satire is to be bullshitting people very artfully and nuanced, you know, and to exercise critical thinking skills. So it is great. But now 
I've developed a bit of a cult following so people will tell other people, oh, that's satire, you know? Like, I don't have to respond to all of them. So, yes, this is just, I think, you know, Prince Harry, easy guy to satirize, I think, for a lot of reasons. Oh, I'm, I'm in the UK now. I love Prince Harry. Hell of a fella. All right. So, this is another one, AI troop sitter giving end of days vibes. <laughs> I just think, you know, there's a lot of existential anxiety right now about like what's going on. So like, this is kind of how I feel about it. <laughs> and uh, the fun thing, well, I got to give, you know, one of my friends had mentioned this where he's like with a meme, it hits on a lot of levels at once. You know, it's like you could write a whole treatise and you could write an extended diatribe or whatever, or you can post like some dumb little photo and like you get the point, you know, so um, all killer, no filler, we'll say. Yes, this is another one. Uh, Aaron Rodgers hallucinates Super Bowl victory. You know, it's good for the sports fans. You know, uh, uh, I'll be speaking at Psychedelic Science this summer. I believe he's going to be there. So I'm looking forward to, you know, satirizing him in person as well. That'd be good. So, um, okay, there it is. Yeah, here's another one. Psychedelic companies lobby for mental health revolution by per pushing the same agenda that fucked us all up. I think uh, <laughs> that's the idea. You know, I think uh, there's... Again, and you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking of these things. I usually just see something and I like to work from top of mind. You know, no, I didn't really prepare any notes or slides or anything. It's like, uh, I don't have to get ready because I stay ready. So I'm always making satire, you know, every day, all day. I'm probably going to have some satire after this. Yeah. Okay. Clicker uh, do. Um, the, the clicker's frozen, but it's very possible. I'm just I can tap dance again. I used to teach high school, so I'm used to coming in like hungover and unprepared and tap dancing. Oh, there it is. Okay, so it's the last slide anyway. So this is where you can find me if you feel so inclined. Mycopreneur podcast. I put out a podcast once a week, sometimes more. And you know, it's funny, a lot of people who see the satire have no idea, even though it's called Mycopreneur Podcast, that I actually have a podcast. But I do, and the podcast I treat with a little bit more rigor and like, you know, asking questions of like I had one scheduled with Amanda Fielding today, which has been postponed, but like a lot of interesting characters. And I, I just like to ask questions that they don't usually get asked. You know, I feel like there's sometimes a morass or like a lack of like really interesting, thought-provoking questions. And I can tell that when I interview people. So like I make it a point to try to like push on certain aspects that don't regularly get discussed. So you can find me at Micropreneur Podcast. I'm quite active on Instagram and I've expanded out with like all the other platforms. And speaking of social media bullshit, I had quite a nice following on TikTok and I got deplatformed for using the word psychedelic. Quite literally, like the, the, the censorship is kind of out of this world. Like you, uh, you use the word psychedelic and you trigger a censor and it's like, so you can't even use a hashtag of psychedelic. You can't use a hashtag of microdose. So it's just like, we're going to just completely omit these from like the largest social media platform for, you know, Gen Z. Uh, over 40% of Gen Z uses TikTok for search over Google. So it's like, these are things that we really need to contend with, I think, especially coming up to the next, at least for people in my country, the next election cycle, like the social media landscape is going to be where a lot of people are unpacking and relating to the information ecosystem. So I just, uh, I feel very well positioned right now, but also, you know, the further I wade into the contentious stuff, the more I just want to make satire because it's just like such a, you know, if I can make people laugh and bring joy that way and also make a few points of social commentary, that's a good day's work in my book. Great. And then I have a sub stack as well called the Post Truth Post. And that's just me usually at 3 a.m. firing off some top of mind thoughts. It's really juicy stuff. So that's, that's all I got right now. And uh, I've got stand up material since I have a few more uh, minutes here. Do I have a minute or two or oh, great? Okay, so I always like to share stories about like psychedelic use outside of a clinical medicalized context, because that's where the majority of us are doing it, quite frankly. And first time I ever tried ketamine was freshman year of college at USF. And I did a fat rail of K in the dorms. I don't try this at home, you know, unless this guy knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. But anyways, so um, was leaving and, you know, I didn't have any materials or information available. I just had other degenerates like me who were just like, yeah, this is probably fine. So I do it and I go in the elevator and then it hit really hard in the elevator. And then I I had to cling on for dear life for like 30 minutes while I was in the K-hole, just going up and down the elevator. So I can say that ketamine really elevated my consciousness. Boom. It's a good one, right? Yeah. And uh, then my dealer the next day asked me, he's like, how was it? I, I reached miraculous and extraordinary heights all the way up to the sixth floor. The come down wasn't so bad either. Every time someone on the ground floor hit the button, I came down. I'm great. Again, this is satire, but there's quite an element of truth mixed in there too. So 
And then uh, UK specific, I think this is peak psychedelic renaissance here. I was coming in through customs at Gatwick and the customs agent asked me, what's the purpose of your, this is good. What's the purpose of your visit to England? I'm working on my accents. And I'm just like, I'm like, oh, I'm here to satirize microdosing coaches. He goes, oh, I've got a microdosing coach. I said, no shit. An agent of the crown leveraging psychedelics to be a more diligent 